the uh, presentations will be given by Wally Boca, myself, and Richard Tiger. And we will start with uh, Wally Boca's presentation. So just want to introduce Wally uh, to those of you who don't know him. I, I realize most of you know him very well. Um, Wally is one of uh, the uh, world experts in uh, climate research. And um, thinking back, I actually got to know Wally as a graduate student uh, through his uh, substantial body of work in uh, ocean chemistry, in ocean geochemistry. And so at around uh, 1981, when he came to, to Germany, where I was studying as, uh, uh, on, on an award from the, the Humboldt Foundation, he was sort of just in the transition to spending more and more time on uh, climate and there, specifically past climate with a focus on the past changes. Um, he stayed with this uh, since then, but uh, not neglecting all these other activities, including ocean geochemistry and geochemistry in general. Um, one of the, the, the um, pieces of work of Wally that he's most known for, and, and a lot of you might have uh, uh, gotten to know him in that context is the so-called uh, Great Ocean Conveyor Belt, about which he first uh, published in the uh, Natural History magazine in the mid-80s, I think 86 or so. Um, Wally has received many recognitions for his uh, work. It would take almost uh, half a lecture to go through all of them. I just will, will uh, name a few of them. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, he, uh, is, uh, he was awarded the, the Ewing Medal, uh, named after the uh, founder of the Lamont Dougherty Earth Observatory, uh, Maurice Ewing, the Red Lesson Prize, the Blue Planet Prize, Tyler Environmental Prize, and the National Medal of Science, and so on. So we could, we could go on for a long time. Um, one uh, remark from my advisor at Heidelberg always comes back to me when I'm uh, thinking about Wally, and that is uh, when I didn't know Wally yet, um, he said, you know, we will have, uh, and I, I knew him from the literature, but not personally, he said we will have uh, Wally Boca on a, on a sabbatical, and uh, I said, that's great. He said, you know, one thing about him that, that you have to know, he's the, the grandmaster of global thinking, and uh, it, it, it's truly uh, a, a good characterization of, of Wally's span and reach of, of uh, intellect and, and achievement. So, uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome Wally Broker. Uh, well, pleasure to be here. I, I was away for a few days, and uh, I came into my office this morning and got an email about this, and I said, what the hell? I have to give a lecture this afternoon. I have totally forgotten. Peter said that he had gotten my agreement, which I guess he did. And, uh, but anyway, uh, I'm glad to be here. I haven't prepared particularly well, but um, I give lectures like this rather frequently, so I'm going to take pieces out of those lectures. I mean, mo uh, most of my work has been on paleoclimate of late, and we really have two ways to look into the future and see what global warming is going to do to us. One is using large computer models that simulate the impact of extra CO2. And the other is to um, look at the past record and see what kind of uh, um, lessons that it has for us. So I want to take the latter route. Richard Seeger will take the former route and talk more about the models. Um, one thing we know about the models is that while they <coughs> give a fairly consistent effort, estimate of global extent of global warming, its average warming to the planet as a function of how much CO2 we put in the atmosphere, uh, they disagree rather widely on the details of a given region. So we're not in very good shape about predicting rainfall in the Sahara or the uh, rate at which Arctic ice will melt or things like that. 
So the uh, record from the past is really useful. So I'd like to talk about two examples. Um, one has to do with the distribution of water. So I think we all know that <clears throat> one of the things that global warming is going to produce is a change in the distribution of rainfall. Overall, it may produce more rainfall, but the distribution of this extra rainfall will not be the same as today's rainfall. Uh, Isaac Held, who is one of the premier atmospheric theoreticians, you might say, he's at Princeton GFTL, has he draws a, the following conclusion from modeling work he's done. And that is that as the planet warms, it'll become the deserts will become even drier than they are now, and the tropics will become even wetter, even wetter. Neither of those things is particularly good, in fact, particularly if he's right about the deserts being drier. Places like the Sahel don't need to be drier, they need to be wetter. Um, so the question is, do we have any verification of that? And I'd like to show you uh, two examples. Um, this is going through a lecture I gave on Tuesday night. Um, the first example comes from the medieval warm. About a thousand years ago, I think everybody agrees, climate uh, was perhaps comparable to today's. There's sizable error on any way to re reconstruct this. I think all of the methods would say that it was, it was uh, warmer than it was during the Little Ice Age. And during that time, in the western United States, a very interesting thing happened. Uh, there were two droughts, I'll just talk about one of them, which occurred during that interval. So this is an interval of comparable warmth to today. So it'd be interesting to see what the water status was in the western United States. Well, a scientist uh, named Scott Stein, who's in the California university system, found an interesting way to demonstrate that during this time there were profound droughts. These were not minor droughts, these were major droughts. He's found, I think, seven places now where you see this kind of thing, trees that are now underwater, which couldn't have grown underwater if their roots were uh, drowned out for more than a few months or even maybe a year they would be killed. These trees, in this case, are in the uh, West Walker River, which drains the Sierra Nevada into the uh, Nevada Desert, across into the Nevada Desert. And that's a steep valley it's along Highway 395, south of Reno. And these trees are all over the place. There's something like 87 of these stumps sticking up. And Scott noticed them during one, he'd driven through here many times and never seen them, and one August dry, a dry summer, he spotted them in the evening and he went down and examined them. And those trees have up to 150 rings. And that means that during that whole 150 years, that river was basically dry because it could ever look like today for uh, even a few years, those trees would have been killed. And he has six other examples of that, all trees in swamps or lakes or uh, places where they could not now grow. And those trees can be dated by radiocarbon to say when they grew, and they grew during the medieval warm. And they can be, uh, the rains can be counted to give you an idea how long the drought was. So these droughts were more intense and certainly far longer than today's. So that's an example we have of a time when maybe it was a little warmer, can't prove that, maybe it was not quite as warm as now. But let's say it was a little bit warmer. Um, that sort of sends a warning 